All right, welcome to part two of our final day of uh, painting glowing colors. In this, today I'm going to be um, using a very, kind of very, very foggy. It's almost in my print, you can barely see that there's a line of trees and stuff back here. This is a little suburban park right near my house. I did a very simplistic wipe away here using a um, transparent earth red and Indian yellow mix. Hi, baby. Um, yeah. So very, very transparent. 10 minutes goes by really fast. Oops, need to mute you guys here if you can. All right, baby. Mute. Your mic is open. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Somebody Linda, needs to mute. Linda, mute. Linda, mute. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay, good. We're all taken care of. And anyways, um, so I and I put out my split primary palette of titanium white, uh, a very light lemon uh, yellow. I'm actually not even sure what color I squeezed out. Um, it is Hansa yellow light, Indian yellow. My red today, instead of a cadmium red medium, is a naphthol scarlet. So for those of you who are um, wanting to use a less dangerous studio or you know don't want to have cadmium colors, naphthol scarlet is a great warm red, a red that leans towards orange compared to the quinacridone uh, red. So it makes a nice warm. It is slightly more transparent than the cadmium red. Um, so that's you know a reason some people don't like it, but I love it because I like somewhat transparent colors. Um, then I've got my quinacridone red. I almost squeezed out quinacridone magenta, but I was thinking um, with the colors I'm seeing here, some of these oranges and stuff, that the magenta might get a little too purple. Um, cause it's basically an in between these two colors between the ultramarine and the quinacridone would be the quinacridone magenta would exist in here. So I can make it easily enough or something similar to it easily enough. Then I've got my ultramarine blue and I've got my manganese blue hue. Um, and again, just to remind you guys, I don't use manganese blue. I use manganese blue hue which is going to save you a lot of money. And the funny thing is, is a lot of people think when they read the word hue at the end of a paint uh, name that it actually means a weakened down version. It does not always mean that at all. Um, it, it, uh, I think it just means that it's a version of it or a synthetic. Somebody's recreated the color. And the, the uh, manganese blue hue is actually much stronger than a, man a true manganese blue is a really weak and very expensive color. Um, and then my guest color is uh, I've got um, Payne's gray. So a kind of a semi-transparent, uh, very cool blue gray. Let's see if I add just a little white to that, where that gray goes. And it gets pretty bluish pretty quick. Um, and I'll probably use that just to darken in some areas. Michael, when you did your underpainting here, did you um, brush things out so they blended, or is those, or is that all just brush strokes? Um, it was done with paper towels, actually. So wiping away with paper towels. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question, and. The truth is I'm going to cover most all of that underpainting, so it's not going to be a big, big issue. It's kind of, again, just a way for me to give myself some notes to kind of ground some things, and I'll probably even change some of that structure a little bit, and I'm just going to put up my reference. Hopefully I have enough mixing room here, and I'm going to attack this painting because I have one hour left. It's 16 inches tall by 20 inches wide. It's pretty big to try to do in one hour. So we're just gonna see what we can do. I also had so much fun doing that Monet painting that I may get a little thicker with the paint, a little more uh, 
exciting. I'm curious to do a very atmospheric scene using a more impressionistic palette. So hopefully you guys are okay with that as far as the idea. The reason I chose this image for this glowing colors class is to do a primarily cool gray down scene with kind of bursts of warm colors. We've got the tops of these grasses. And then we're also going to have warmth in the sky and in the reflection, but it's all going to be soft edge and kind of hazy. So we'll have a diffused glow in this painting, if that makes sense. All right. Today is going to be test day. Hopefully you guys were all studying and you're ready for a pop-up exam. Is that what it's called, a pop-up exam? A uh, surprise exam? I can't remember the word. School was always so terrifying for me. But anyways. Pop quiz. Pop quiz. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pop quiz. All right. Who's ready for a pop quiz? What is my, or what is the way that I prefer to build up an oil painting? What are kind of my three guidelines for building an oil painting? Light source, values, and shapes. Okay, dark, what was the... What dark was the to light. Dark, dark to light. Yes. Yeah. Big light. shapes. Big shapes. Big shapes, so big to small. Thin to thick. Thin to thick. Perfect. You guys nailed it. All right. A plus for everybody. <laughs> Yay. A plus for everybody. Enjoy your summer. You're all dismissed. <laughs> so I'm going to come back in and I'm going to look at how dark that is. Isn't that wild? Um, I'm going to give Ow. myself my design and my structure back. I'm going to come back in with my darks and give myself a foundation to build upon. So my darks give me my structure. Got this nice Payne's gray, which is a wonderful shortcut color, but I don't want it to be just black. So I'm gonna add hints of color in there that mixed in a little, a uh, little bit of, uh, ultramarine blue to cool it down and then I went ahead and also up in this corner of it mixed a little bit of my quinacridone red so it leads towards purple so I'm gonna have variety in my darks I don't want to just have a big dark area I don't think that's how shadows work I don't think that's how we see them um, I find that uh, a lot of beginning painters will just overly simplify their darks and just make you know especially if you have a photo like this, that's not a very good photo. And so all of a sudden this whole area just reads as black or this whole area just reads as black. It's up to us as the creators, as the painter to, to, to give some life into that, to bring some color and some interest and, uh, All right, so already this is harking back to what we were talking about in the um, in the uh, feedback or in the critique that we were just doing. Do you guys see how these darks are wanting to start to come forward compared to the other yeah. dark the other darks that are back here? See how these darks are so much lighter and fall back; they recede into space even though it doesn't make sense and I haven't built a good structure yet. Darks wanna come forward, darkest darks, as do actually lightest lights or high chroma, the strongest colors also oftentimes wanna come forward. To make things recede into space, we make them a little lighter in value oftentimes. We make them a little bluer, a little grayer, a little cooler. We also take away their strong edges. Crisp edges want to come forward. Softer edges want to recede back into space. 
oftentimes. Yeah. And again, I'm just, I'm basically just vi revisiting this painting and just saying, you know what? I've got to make up some choices. I've got to make, make up my mind. Where, where is the edge of the bank? Where does it meet the water, right? I may get rid of all that. I may add fog over the top, but it's just kind of important for me to know that. So as I'm building up my structure and my design, I just know how things are interacting, where they exist in space. You'll also notice when I'm doing my banks, a lot of times, even though it will appear to be at an angle like that, I don't put it like that. I'll often do it in a number of horizontal lines going up at an angle. Uh -huh. Isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. yeah. And it helps to ground things, to make them feel like they're not just floating away. And I remember like when I first started to see that in nature, how weird it was. Like, is anybody else seeing this? That it's just a bunch of horizontal lines and they go together to create a diagonal line and I just found that that really helped things to feel like they weren't floating away or going up a hill or down a hill um, this water is very flat it's going to be you know it's a pond it's quite I don't want to say stagnant but you know what I mean? It's still, it's not a flowing river. It's not going down. There's no rapids or waterfalls. And so sometimes it can be difficult to make it look like that is happening. So I'm just perusing. I'm just looking for grounding points where are some darks where are some shadow areas that i can use to give myself structure do you remember how soft and floaty everything was just a little bit ago and now by having some grounding points i guess would be a good way to say it There's often times when I, I've, I, I've put a painting away for a little bit and I'm coming back to it. And I just don't know where to start, how to get back into it, or I've lost the plot a little bit in the painting. And often what I will do is what I'm doing right now. I will just reestablish my shadows, reestablish my darks, and that will give me my structure back and i, I like to the almost the uh, the metaphor of i'm putting on my house's foundation so that i can build it up and then i can begin to decorate it right so many of us as painters want to start with picking out the blinds and the carpet you know but first, we actually have to have our foundation, our structure of that painting. We've got to build it up. We have to put, build something nice and sound for those things to go on. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. So I went ahead and took some of this uh, darks, brought it over. I'm going to lighten it up a little bit because I want to begin to push my shadows back. So I'm gonna kind of create my next line. Of darks. 
but I want them to begin to recede into space. I'm looking at that, it's reading is too purple, so I'm just altering it slightly so that it doesn't destroy, I don't know, it doesn't affect everything else that I put on top too much. Ah, it's interesting, it really wants to stay purple. That little bit of quinacridone red that I put in there is really strong compared to these cools, but I want to keep it kind of cool, especially on the edges away from where I know my light source is going to be. There we go. You see how these are still my darks. I'm still establishing my darks, but they're way back there and they're in that deep, foggy haze. So they're getting quite a bit lighter. I know that my creek is turning and going back towards here. So my ground is probably also kind of going to make a place for that creek to go through. Even though I'm not going to see that creek back here, I'm giving it a place to go. I may even open up some of these trees over here so that my creek, you know. Feel free to ask questions as I'm painting here, just because this is kind of our final, our final uh, class of uh, this term. Um, I don't always start my paintings as wipe away paintings. A lot of times I will do kind of the more structural drawing. Um, I like the way those uh, the brush held some of the darks and some of the lights. So when you put it on, it's not completely mixed. Right. Yeah, you can see my piles are not completely mixed either. Um, added. Yeah, I like to let some of that swirling. That's a good observation. Is that Michelle? Yes. Can tell the terms almost over. I'm actually recognizing everybody's different voices and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> Michelle, you've been with me for a while, painting with me for a while, but um, yeah, kind of nice so in the my, beginning of having to really observe and make sure I see everybody who's talking to figure out who's talking. And then, of course, on the last day, I can start recognizing your voices. We just need uh, 14 week classes versus seven week classes. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, I think so too. Forever and ever. Yeah, this class is never ending classes. I love classes. <laughs> Me too. So much fun hanging out with you guys. You guys have such good questions and, uh, you know, it's so nice uh, having Diane in the class and just having everybody's adding, you know, different insights, different ideas, different questions. And uh, it's just, it's always so fun. I just, you know, you try to prepare for a class and for a workshop and for everything else, but it's always so interesting that inevitably people just come in with such great questions and great insights that, have, you know, you always got to be willing to kind of go down the rabbit hole as it were. Michael, you've got some medium in that. Is that right? Because it's dripping? Uh, it's only just a uh, touch of paint thinner. And you saw that, yeah, that dripping scared me. So I actually wiped my brush off. Um, I did, do not want it to be wet like that. I, you just can't add paint on top of a really wet underpainting. And you can hear it's pretty scrubby. I actually put down my better brush. Um, I don't know if you noticed that, but I put down a brush that has a nice square shape because I was using it to scrub, which will turn it into a filbert. And so why not just pick up a filbert instead of possibly ruining a nice brush? And it's not ruining it, it's just changing its shape. So you've got a pretty light um, scrubbing. I mean, you're kind of lightly scrubbing, right? 
Yeah. Can I, you I mean, it? I don't, I, I mean. Go ahead. Oops, I lost you a little bit. If if I scrubbed like that, I would be muddying up everything. So I guess what I'm seeing and is that it's always a color that goes well with the next color. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah, because I know I'm going to build up on top of these lights. And you know what? I can even say, you know what? I've overly darkened some of these areas because it's going to be really a, a light, light sky with these trees barely hinted at. So I can, in fact, just... Isn't that interesting? Just take my paper towel, hold up a bunch of it. But now that paint will be even less slick, less thick. I will be able to build up on top of that really quickly. But yeah, no, that's a good observation. That's a, uh, the three, like, yeah, it is. It's about building up the colors that won't muddy up too much. Like I'm putting on purples and grays and blues here. So if I come across with just yellows and uh, it will muddy up because I'll have introduced all three primary colors. Two primaries will make a secondary. As soon as you start in adding that third one, you are introducing the ideas of browns. So if you were going to transition from that purplish background of mm -hmm. sky into green, that would, would you wait for it to dry? Or I would just put it over really lightly. Like if I really like needed some strong greens on there. I can do it, but I just put it on very lightly. Because watch, as soon as I start to push down or start to dab, it will start to blend. Yeah. But isn't that fun? Like, even just that little wild green bright experiment is not, it's not permanent. I just. Can be wiped back away. Oils are very forgiving. But they don't always feel that way. It's got to remember to get the paint off there or use a palette knife and wipe it away or whatever it is to get that paint off. Also, again, I don't want things too runny. I don't want them too wet. I want to be able to control. I want to be able to put things on your pressure. We're going to talk about that a lot in the next term in the um, edge work class and brush work class. Pressure is amazingly undervalued and amazingly important when your painting is just fluctuating the just how hard you're touching the surface, how firm your touch is, because sometimes you want to, and other times just loading along. Okay, so I feel like for the most part, I've established my structure. Feels kind of like a long time. Like I've just used 20 minutes out of 60 minutes, one third of my time, to just reestablish my drawing, my, my structure, my shadows, my values. But it's so worth it to me because it's kind of a huge amount of the battle for me.
So you were saying that you were using a filbert and then you weren't. What? Or... No, I was using a flat initially, a nice, nice, somewhat new brush. I put it out. It's a nice new shape. I like those hard edges, those crisp, sharp edges. Flat. I almost only buy flats. You know, long bristle, short bristle, whatever it is. But I love flats because I like because you can use them to get nice, delicate marks. But as you use them, mm -hmm. they become more filbert like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then after you've really been mean to them for a long time, they become true filberts. Wow. Like this is actually the brush I should be using. Because oh. it's, you know, I don't want to keep scrubbing with my flats because I keep destroying the corners. So instead, I might as well be scrubbing with my filberts. And it's like when you're a little kid and you want to sharpen your pencil and you don't have a pencil sharpener, so you just start rubbing it on its edge really quick to build a, a sharp point again. Well, I can really build a sharp filbert by just using it over and over and over and rubbing it down wow and uh so i like to joke that you know i never buy filberts because i just make my own my flats <laughs> become filberts if they once i've scrubbed them down they become too brutalized and too uh splayed out for whatever reason then i have just cut them and then they become shorts which mm -hmm. i don't use shorts anymore um, but I used to use shorts, meaning just that bristles were really short on the brush. And that for some reason, I felt like that was more comfortable. Like, <laughs> I don't know, somehow they felt safer, but I don't use them anymore. Do you ever use round brushes? And if so, when, where? Um, I use rounds to do like branches and stuff. I'm trying to see if I have a round. I have a really rough, this is like a kid's one, and it has no shape at all, but I'll, I'll just use this to, you know, make some marks. And But I know I never use that brush. Um, this is almost like a round, but it's super long bristle. Where There we go. What do you, what do you use that one for? Branches and stuff, because I can, oops, I block with my arm, but I can make, just such crazy, interesting marks. Let's see. Because I can push down with it and really make, and then all of a sudden pull up and make these really fine marks. It's not showing up. Let me get a darker paint. And I get the idea. It's like making calligraphy like with a Chinese you know brush for there I can just make beautiful just odd little marks and I just kind of let it dance and do its thing it's also fun to draw with you know it makes just interesting irregular marks so sometimes I'll just kind of quickly block in you know, some kind of a drawing or structure there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump. Normally I do dark to light, but I'm also doing big to small. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump to my lights a little bit maybe. So they've got a couple more darks to kind of block in really quickly because they're pretty important. I don't want you guys to be bored, so I, you know, I'm so tempted to just kind of jump ahead of myself and where I get ahead of where I should be. But I'm going to block in my lights really quick just so I can get an idea of where they are, and those will help to dictate. Um, how the colors on the ground plane 
are playing and how they're reading. Again, that whole, where's my light source? My light is going to be coming from here, but it's very, very diffused. It's very soft. It's heavy, heavy, heavy fog. Hmm. Trying to figure out my temperature shift from the light up in here as it's coming across. It's going to be warm till about here. Same thing's going to happen down here. And then it's going to get cooler as it gets further from this point. What yellow are you using? A combination of my Hansa and my Indian yellow. But I'm going to be using more Hansa yellow as it gets back because that's a cooler yellow. My Indian yellow plus white makes a nice warm yellow. Okay. Good question. So, Michael, I, I, it's a little bit hard to see your reference, but did you determine then the light source or is it somewhere? Yeah, it's going to be right behind in this area. I mean, did you determine it or was it in the photo? It's in my photo. Okay. Yeah, this is a creek that's so close to my house that, you know, I visit it often on a lot of my walks with my wife. And uh, even when I go drive by, oftentimes I'll just kind of go stop to just study kind of what's going on. Check in on my new tree of buddies. Those are the weird rat-like beavers. Oh my, they have new trees there. Oh, we got lots of them. Lots and lots. You know, <laughs> there's a place in Georgia that is was trying to, because they were, you know, they were brought into the country as a way to make fur coats. Yeah. Um, but there's a place in Georgia, I believe, or maybe it's, I think it's Georgia that they're trying to actually have like a Nutria burger. <laughs> burger? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can only imagine how oily they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Just greasy looking animals. Um, but their babies are sure cute. And it's fun to watch them. My wife and I were uh, on our last walk on Sunday, was it? We uh, had a little nutria following us up the creek a little ways. And then a crow came down and scared it away. It was pretty funny. And then literally there was a sign that the crow landed on that said, do not feed the animals and had a picture of a bird and a nutria on the sign. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a duck on the sign, but not a crow. But anyways, I'm just trying to uh, get some warmth here. If, I would be scared to death to put all that white on the creek. <laughs> <laughs> Just seeing how hot can I get with things? Not that hot. It's too hot. Too hot. So on the palette, you can definitely see the pinks and the yellows, but when you put it on the painting, it looks pure white. Right next to all this strong yellow that's on yeah. here. Yeah. That's funny. Mm -hmm. it's totally right. Hi, Kitty. So are you going to try and make this really foggy and cool, like in the in your reference? Yeah, kind of. I'll probably make it a little more, <laughs> you know, better than a bad photo, a bad print from a bad photo. But, you know, somewhat similar, yeah. Michael, did you put pure white for the sun in the sky? I haven't put the sun yet. No, there's no pure white anywhere. It just reads that way because it's on that yellow. Watch what happens is I get more and more of that yellow covered. It will start to read 
is a different color. But yeah, right now, our silly little uh, camera going through Zoom, because unfortunately, Zoom um, condenses the image a little bit and takes away some of the quality. Um, so maybe eventually we'll find a service where when you're teaching live that that there's not a condent a condensing, but also then it would just mean that it was using a lot of more bandwidth to send the uh, you know so that we could be communicating. Let's see. So I'm going to come across and cover this area because this is the cool part of the sky, as is this part of the water. So I'm going to. We'll see if that doesn't make some of this other area feel a little warmer once I get it covered and the camera's not trying to focus and figure out what's going on. That color looks cooler. So you mixed paint gray, paints gray with white? Yeah, and a bit of the, both of the blues are in there as well. Okay. okay. And then a lot of white. So that's reading is really blue. I don't want it quite so blue. So. You mix a little bit of the yellow. So it was dark to light previously, just kind of reestablishing my shapes and my form. And now I'm thinking big to small and the sky area and the water area are both quite large. And again, they're also gonna help me to decide on what colors are going into the ground because they're the things that are illuminating the ground plane. So if I had a really warm red light, then my you know, corresponding things that are being hit by that light would also be reddish. Or in this case, it's going to be kind of a, a light yellow, soft light. Did you say you're using paints gray in, in the if blue? There is some paints gray, both of the blues, a bit of the red. I think okay. probably have a little bit of every one of the colors in here right now, just to make a nice kind of neutralized gray. And the, the back trees with the lavender, um, was that white and um, what was that? Quinacridone red and a bit of Payne's gray, probably ultramarine blue. Make sure I'm using enough paper towels so that when things start to get muddy and murky in areas, a lot of times that's just me being lazy, just not cleaning my brush as much as I could. Um, I have to just, you know, be aware that so much of what's happening is just because I'm just shortcutting things. I'm just not cleaning my brush. I'm not mixing clean colors. Um, a lot of times I like to say the paint's not working, but it's actually just me being lazy. My brush isn't working because I'm not changing my grip and using a conductor's wand so I can make lots of different marks and change my pressure. Oh, 
Okay, Michael, I have a question. Now you went with the, the warm underpainting. How different would you think this would be if you went with a cool underpainting, like with a Payne's gray? Probably be cooler. Um, <laughs> be uh, cooler? <laughs> well, that's true. Thanks for laughing at my joke. Oh, <laughs> um, it would be, yeah, I mean, it, it probably would be pretty different, especially right at this stage, it'd be quite different. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, depending on how much I cover of the space, it could be, you know, pretty much exactly the same. Um, and it just depends. I, you know, do like to leave fragments of my underpainting. A lot of people don't. Um, it, a lot of people just aren't comfortable doing it. I also, though, let sometimes beautiful underpaintings really get me in trouble because I try to preserve them and I just need to be covering them and uh, getting you know, making things happen. Um, and so a lot of times, especially in the early stages of your painting, if you fall in love with any aspects of it, you can just find yourself slowing way down because you're protecting it. And you're trying to preserve these silly little things that you can just recreate again and again. I, you know, I can come back over the top of this with warm color again as I'm building it up. I don't need to preserve all of it. Um, so, yeah. I suppose it would be really um, a, a good lesson to just do a do the same um, reference photo with a cool underpainting and a warm, then a then a warm. Yeah, and, and then see what happens. Just black and white, and just see which is more comfortable for you. Um, yeah, and then we just that's my big fear about like the, how I've started teaching lately with the. Uh, with the black and white acrylic painting, with these beautiful kind of wipe away paintings, is that we can really, really end up hurting ourselves by making beautiful paintings too fast. Mm -hmm. I would prefer that they're ugly and that we just keep attacking them and keep <laughs> trying new things as I'm opposed so to protecting them and defending them. Well, there's no problem with the ugly department. Yeah. Good, good, good. All right. That, I mean, it really is, I, you know, if my painting doesn't go through ugly phases, it, I just know that I'm not going for it. I'm playing it safe. I'm trying to sneak up on it. But in fact, you know, especially on a painting like this, where I've only got an hour to get as much as I can done, you know, I can't play it safe. I've got to just kind of keep going for it, keep attacking and keep trusting myself. There's, something magical about time limitations or about you know painting in plain air and just having to go for it um and what happens sometimes is that whole part of our brain that's constantly like uh oh you're gonna get in trouble uh oh you're gonna you know you're gonna mess it up that part finally kind of shuts down because it has to and we're kind of it allows us to get into our more instinctual side of painting you know and it, it helps that i've been painting for you know 20 something years now and have all this information to kind of fall back on but uh i guess it'd be kind of like getting in the zone right where all of a sudden you're just yeah. reacting you're just making choices they might not be the right one, but now you're just reacting to that choice and to that choice and to that choice. And you're just constantly kind of building it up. Also with the knowledge that, you know what, I just need to get it covered so that I can begin to actually read how the colors are playing together and how they're responding to each other. Nope. Thought maybe if I changed the brush stroke to horizontal, it wouldn't look so odd, but 
gets really glary when I do horizontal brush strokes with this light. I'm really sad, though, that this is our last class. I've had a lot of fun. We, uh, I think the color class is always just so nice in the middle of winter. Um, just yeah. even if I'm painting a wintry, dull, dreary scene right now, just the idea of all the colors and the warmth that I can bring in. Um, I don't know. Really nice. I'm sad, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, for those of you who choose to join us, We'll be back soon, really soon. This is like, I think it's only like on the 8th or something that the next class yeah, starts. Eight. That's crazy. That's barely enough time for a nap. <laughs> Are you still taking students in the, my, 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 master, my, my what is it, Masterius? <laughs> yeah, Masterius, I guess. I think. I don't, maybe, I don't, maybe I'm saying it wrong. Um, there's one spot left. And that's tonight, right? Yeah, it's tonight. Yeah, in a couple hours. Barely enough time for a nap. Um, <laughs> yeah. Get done here and run to the bank and get notarization, give away so I can get money for my car <laughs> so I can have a car so I can get to Seattle to go teach a workshop this weekend. <laughs> Busy day, but it's all right. Now, the tops of these grasses, these oranges in here, are what really draws me in. I think the warms versus the cools, and these warms really want to come forward. And I like, I normally I would think like, oh, I shouldn't even put in that green. It's such an odd color to put into this palette. But I actually think that these greens are what helps these reds and warms to read even more significantly, right? You put oranges next to greens and reds, especially next to greens, and they feel really vibrant, even though in truth, they're quite brown. But next to those greens, they really sing. And then also the lights next to the darks, right? So we we're asking about all the uh, the detail in that hillside um, earlier. You know, I basically have hinted at some darks and I've got some mids. And now by simply coming across and adding a couple new values, all of a sudden detail starts to, the idea of detail starts to appear. So it's edges, lights versus darks, warms versus cools, sharp edges, brown and soft edges. So much of texture is just where two things meet up, two values, two colors, two temperatures, whatever it is, but where those things meet is what gives us the idea of detail so much. Oftentimes we really like, oh, how do I make so-and-so detail? Just look at where that, that edge meets the other edge. Where does this green meet, or green meet the red? Where does the dark meet the light? And just look into that and just kind of decide what's happening there. But keep asking better questions than I just did because that was that got really hot really fast and I realized that it's not that warm it might look really warm to me in the photo but then I have to go okay why does it look so warm oh yeah because it's dark versus light it's warm versus cool it's not actually you know bright 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 red it just looks bright because of what it's next to
And those reds are getting duller as they recede back into space. So by simply adding some greens to those, I'm neutralizing these reds as they go back. They're still gonna be hinted at, but they're definitely not as warm as they go back into space or as intense of a high chroma color. They're getting grayer, they're getting duller, but I want to keep them going. I don't want to just have warms here and here and nothing in the background. I've got to let it let the viewer know that no, in fact, those colors are back there. Those warms, those bushes continue back there, but they're just caught up in the atmosphere. And so they're duller. See the tops of them kind of growing up out of that, out of the shadows way back here. Just letting them kind of peek through lately. It is so soft and mysterious. It's getting just but it's beyond so, gorgeous. Yeah, good. And it's funny that your brain will just decide what this is it'll go oh there's a there's a bush back there not that mike's telling me too much that there is but just enough enough information nice and soft it's just a bush back in the fog a little closer than the the trees that it's in front of Just the idea, the I'm not, yeah, I'm not beating you over the head with look at this beautiful bush back here. It's just, yep, there's a bush. There's some shapes. They're getting a little bit of light. They're in the fog. They're relating to the things that they're in, that they're within, that they're being lit by, that they're being influenced by. And it's up to you as the viewer to kind of decide what it is that you're seeing. And in fact, you don't even have to decide. Your brain just fills it in. It's, I think we find that so rewarding. I think our brains like appreciate us honoring them and saying, here, do some of the work. I'm not gonna tell you everything. I'm going to give you hints. I'm going to give you clues. Again, looking at like Rembrandts and things like that, where you just see these figures kind of coming in and out of darkness, where you'll see like an arm reaching out of a shadowy area and the arm will be in the light. And then in the background, you'll see this figure and your brain just goes, yeah, I know that figure. He's back there. He's, you know, he's wearing this, he's doing that. But then when you actually look at a Rembrandt painting up close, the shadow stuff is just barely described. And I think we just find so much joy in that. I think that we rob our viewers so often by overtelling them. And that's, again, that is my opinion. That is just how I see paintings and how I enjoy paintings is I don't want to over, you know, I love photorealistic paintings. I just don't care to paint them. But I find that atmospheric or mysterious or you know paintings that are not telling you everything but tell you enough i just find those more rewarding i might again i just find more joy in looking at it and that's again very personal so you you know as you go to museums and galleries and art shows or uh, well-ordained coffee shops constantly be saying you know do i like these paintings do i am i enjoying this am i finding the light while looking at this is it, you know, is it tickling something inside of me that makes me want to keep looking at it? Or no, is it boring to me? Um, you know, and why? Is it the subject? Is it the colors? Is it the value structure? What is it that you like 
and what is it you don't like and just then take that information home with you to your own studio when you're making your work i always feel guilty when people come away from my classes thinking oh photorealism bad <laughs> you know tonalism good you know muted colors good vibrant colors bad because that's not at all that's just me that's i'm attracted to the earthier duller colors uh, oftentimes i love you know grays and blues and uh, golds and you know the the colors right out of the tube are gorgeous but i wouldn't decorate my house with any of these i'm I, <laughs> but I love going to people's houses who do, who are brave enough to, you know, I love going to countries where their houses are vibrant and alive, but I just, I don't, I think it would make me feel crazy to live in it all the time. Um, so just, it's, it's all finding your tastes, respecting your tastes, and realizing too that, you know, if you're chasing the market, if your goal is ever to sell paintings, and somebody came up and said, you know what, Mike, you need to paint primary colored paintings. That's what sells. People want circus art and, you know, high intensity, high chroma paintings. I wouldn't do it because people can tell when you're painting things that you love. If you're chasing the market, if you're chasing the colors, if you're chasing the designers, if you're chasing the, you know, whatever it is people can tell and i know because i've done lots and lots of chasing because i you know trying to make a living doing this is tricky but you don't need a thou you don't need everybody to like your work you only need a couple a couple people with a couple dollars in their wallet And then you can do it and they'll help you buy more paint and you can do another one. And... You guys probably didn't know I brought my soapbox in today into the studio. So I can stand on it. And... <laughs> Sorry. Is, your, is, is your daughter an oil painter or acrylic? <laughs> no, acrylic. She hates oils. I, I oh, almost really? like hates them now. <laughs> because it's become such an ongoing joke in our family. Um, she really likes <laughs> watercolors, gouache, um, but now nah, she won't touch oils. Did I ever tell you guys the story of the first time she painted with oils? No. Pure rebellion. What's that? It said pure rebellion. <laughs> oh yeah, no, right? Yeah, totally. That's why I'm no, like, yeah, go ahead, get a bunch of tattoos. I don't care. You know, but then yeah. I tell her I need to paint oils. She's an acrylic or watercolors. Anyways, let me tell the cute, it's a cute story. It's fast. Um, my daughter and I, uh, for years and years, have done joint paintings where we paint together, where like she'll start it, I'll finish it, I'll start one, she'll finish it, or we'll just literally paint on the same painting at the same time. Um, a lot of them have been pretty yeah. big, like three foot by four foot and stuff. A lot of times they're either on the easel or even on the ground, laying on the ground. Um, and we'll just paint, you know, kind of hunkered, hunched over them. But it, it's been a fun, ongoing project. We call our paintings O2 for two Orwicks. And um, yeah, anyways, I have a bunch of them um, hanging in the house. Some are really, really abstract. Some are a little more representational landscapes, but all of them are weird and fun. And generally, I, don't know, I wouldn't even say colorful. Um, but they're different. They're definitely experimental. Um, when did when did she start painting with you? Oh, immediately. No. As soon as she could pick up a brush. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got some really, really, really cute pictures of her um, painting as a little kid. Um, like one time we were out plein air painting in our garden. And I looked over and she painted a whole scene of all her friends up on a stage with spotlights on them and uh, her, her whatever four-year-old boyfriend at the time 
Max Savage playing the grand piano. <laughs> it's like, I thought we were painting the garden. What happened? And she's like, oh, well, you know, I started with this. That made me want to wear my flowery dress. And then I painted myself and then my friend should be in it. And <laughs> it was really cute. Um, but anyway, it's the first time she's ever painting oils is I was starting a painting and I told her, I'm like, you know, for the first time, we're going to do oils together. And I uh, turned away, went to the other easel to work on one of my assignments, projects, and uh, left her alone, just working with the oils. And um, whenever she, at, she was probably like six or seven, whenever she would start painting with her fingers, which is pretty okay with acrylics and stuff, I would take that as a sign that she's starting to get bored and, uh, you know, there's a limited amount of time that you get to paint with a little kid before they just start making messes and get, they're bored. So anyways, that was the cue. And I just like, oh, I, I turned around and she was painting with oil paints with her fingers. And I was like, oh, no, 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 you can't. Sorry, I should have told you, blah, blah, blah. You can't paint with oils with your fingers. Um, and we have a sink up here in the studio. And I told her to wash her hands. And then I went back to starting to work on my project again. And no joke, I'm working and I kind of just forget that she's over there washing her hands and you just kind of get used to the sound of this running water. And it, I bet you it's been like 15, 20 minutes, the water's running. And I finally peek back in on her and there's paint all over the sink, paint up the walls of the bathroom, uh, <laughs> along the sides, all over the faucet handle. Oh, and, no. and the, paint's, the paint's not washed off her hands, it's just moved all over because oh. she's using water with the oil paint. So bad oh. day, told her anything. And she turns and she's just bawling, crying. And she, you know, she realizes she's made a mess. And every time she tries to make the mess any cleaner, it just spreads. And she's just so sad and so distraught. And she turns to me with her hands up in the air and she goes, why do we even have these in the house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was so sad and so funny. But truthfully, she never, never recovered from that. <laughs> has she had some shows oh she's had eight or nine gallery shows oh. yeah she's she used to make a, quite a bit of money painting and she's still does uh still does some commission work and different things like that she's done a whole bunch of work for a um, children's um, psychiatric hospital down in the la area and yeah wow. but uh she uh definitely knows when to just kind of call it a day and just but yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy. She had a lot of money for a little kid. And um, she decided that that, I don't know what it was. She decided that she was kind of done for a while and went and got a normal job and was making minimum wage for quite a long time. And so it's an, it's an interesting thing. She's good with her money. She saved it. She still has it um, for the most part, you know. And, uh, but as we're getting ready to go to school and stuff, all of a sudden that, you know, lots of money for a little kid doesn't look like that much money anymore when you're all of a sudden realizing how much college costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's she's true. Been, she's been investing and in everything else since she was a little kid. Well, but, um, what's her name? Her name's Elena Grace. Uh, Elena Grace Orwick or Ego. <laughs> E-G-O. <laughs> oh. Yeah, she, for a little while, I was thinking she was going to start a company called Ego, Des Ego Designs. Feed your ego. <laughs> Anyways, um, this is not a bad spot to kind of stop. I'll bring the camera back. It's, you know, I haven't done anything in here. There's no, no real detail or anything, but it, it, it gives me a chance to kind of see how are these colors playing together? How are my shapes? How are my values? Um, that is exactly one hour of painting. Um, and you can see how much, you know, depending on your opinion of it, how much damage or how much coverage, um, whatever it is. Um, there's, you know, it's still messy and everything else, but I can just keep building and working and finessing and everything else. But I think that it's off to a fairly decent start. I've got a, it's really dark. Um, it with the lights off. Um, let's see if I open a window and let a little light in. Oh. Um, yeah, it's better. Yeah, so that's kind of in between. Again, here's with the light, it'll blast out. But I want you to 
be able to see some of the transitions of color and stuff in the sky and in the water a little better. Um, I didn't blend them, so it just goes from warm to cool right there. Um, but anyways, it was uh, that's, it, it's a fun start. I'm feeling pretty good about that. Um, and uh, I really like the background fog and the warmth. So you can see that from that underpainting, very, very little of it still showing in this painting. Um, and, and a lot of it will still get covered more. Um, but yeah, any questions, comments? Uh, Would you let that you dry it? now and then go back to it? Oh, I hope to finesse it more before it's dry. Um, I need to run to the bank and do all mm -hmm. that stuff. And then I'll come back home and paint for a while as I get ready for the Mastrius uh, get together this afternoon, evening. Um, so I hope to. There's definitely a lot more that can be done. But again, I think it's a nice start for, again, one hour. Good coverage. I'm kind of beginning to read the colors and see how they're playing together. And um, yeah, and then you can also see in the reference there, I've got little spindly uh, fall trees there without any leaves on them. And you can see I just left those out. I can decide if I want to bring some trees, some, you know, draw some of the finer detail stuff over the tops as uh, as I progress. Um, but I have to remember detail will come. I'm not chasing detail yet. Don't really have any sky holes. I don't have, you know, lots and lots of stuff. It's just big shapes, big colors, big values, big temperature shifts, um, basically blocking in and getting an idea of what's going on. So, so Michael sure to post it. Yeah, right. What? Be sure to post it when it's done. All right. Well, yeah. Michael, right. how did you how did you like doing it this way with with the thicker paint and sort of the more brush strokes as opposed to I remember a long time ago when we you did this in another class you had more of the um you know the bigger brush that you used. How did you like it this time? I am enjoying um, the fact that I'm making myself go over the top and just work on my uh, painting brushstroke pressure um, and painting wet over wet over wet versus just building it up, building it up. Um, and again, Michelle, it's just a matter of it's not like I like one or more the other better. It's for me, it's a matter of comfort. I've got to keep a certain level of discomfort, I feel like, for growth you know, constantly kind of challenging myself a little bit. Um, but there's nothing that says I won't, my goal would be to combine them more and more and more. So having thin brushed out areas, and uh, I've talked about uh, Joaquin Soroya. Um, in this class, I believe a famous Spanish painter. Um, looking at his work in person, um, I've been to three of his different shows, well, two of his shows in his studio in Spain. And just really being able to appreciate the use of thin and thick paint. And then also after seeing his work, revisiting Monet in a couple of different shows and seeing his work up close and realizing how Monet was using thin and thick paint together as well, just kind of reignited something within me of like, oh, you know, I've been really overly reliant on just this one side of painting and not, you know, using both. I think, you know, just like, to make something glow, you have to have cools, right? To make something feel warm, you have to have cools. To make something vibrant, you have to have something dull. And I also feel that that could be the case with uh, thick and thin paint as well. Um, yeah, I mean, this is quite vibrant. It's a lot more vibrant than I thought it was going to be, at least on the monitor as I'm sitting down here. So I may, you know, come back and dull this down a little more because I really do like kind of the moody earthiness of the original photo. Um, I like it. Thanks. Um, Me too. Yeah, so there's the earthy, dully grayness of the photo. Can you guys see it? Uh -huh. Okay. Nice. So yeah, I mean, I was attracted to this and I've definitely gotten away with having all the purples and pinks in the background and making my oranges or the tops of the grasses much more warm and stuff but yeah so i will have to just kind of go you know it'd be nice to have this little break to run to the bank and get that project done and then come back with it'll be you know an hour hour and a half that'll give me a chance to get fresh eyes on it and uh to judge it a little more honestly and truthfully 
and you'll, you'll put it up choice. on Padlet. You'll, you'll, you'll put it up on Padlet when you're finished. Uh, sure. I mean, we're going to meet together next week, so uh, I can share it then, too. Okay. So, yeah, um, please go and sign up for um, the uh, clouds, trees, water, <laughs> brushwork class if you get a chance and if you would like to. Michael, um, is that in studio only? I'm sorry, what? Is that in studio only? No, You're no, it's the same, just class. like this class on Zoom. It's going to be on Zoom? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I, when I looked at it through, was it OPM or whatever it's called? It, it said it was in class. Uh oh. <laughs> Let me. So it's on Zoom? Yeah. Oops. Let's it's see. That would be a bummer. Um, yeah, I wrote online on my I website. Did, Michael, I didn't read that. It's, uh, it's listed on their brochures. <laughs> Excuse me. Online. Oh, it says online right here, painting oh, online. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah. I, I think it did originally say class only oh, about okay. a, a month ago, um, but I think oh. it's been, it was corrected since then, oh, and okay. that, that was on the OSA site. Okay, yeah, there, because there it says painting online, and then when you yeah. scroll down, online yeah. class. Because the first, I know the first time I looked at it, it it said um, in person, and so I I didn't sign up. Yeah, that's what I thought. I wanted it to be like this, you know. Well, so, yeah, it would have been a bummer because I would have not shown up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, but I, but I think they corrected it. I don't know somewhere. Yeah, online. so I do have my workshop this weekend is in person in in, um, in Edmonds near uh, Seattle. Oh, and then I will have um, uh, in person workshop at Manuka. Um, this year, we just finally booked the time for that, and I can look really quickly, just if you want to write it down. I haven't posted anything about it. That will be August um, 14th through the 17th, and then I have a workshop at Sitka Center, which is near um, Lincoln City um, on... July 7th through the 10th. So if you want in person oh. classes, there are a couple opportunities. Mm. Oh, so, and then there will be one more in Seattle. Um, okay. September 30th and October 1st. That's another in person one. So there will be some in person, but I really like teaching over Zoom. I really enjoy it. I mean, I love, especially like at Manuka. If, if, if you guys ever get the opportunity to join me at Manuka, it is wonderful. It's so yeah. fun. It's just such a beautiful little spot right up in the Columbia River Gorge. Um, they feed you. They house you. 